The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star at its rising, and have come to do him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was greatly troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it has been written through the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, since from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and ascertained from them the time of the star's appearance. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I too may go and do him homage. After their audience with the king, they set out. And behold, the star that they had seen at its rising preceded them until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. They were overjoyed at seeing the star, and on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. They opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed from their country by another way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? That's the Annunciation, what was just sung. It's an ancient tradition. The Annunciation of, this is going to sound nice and technical, but of the movable feast days of the liturgical calendar. Let me bring that down just a little bit. These movable feast days are the days that, are, that don't land on the same uh, calendar day each year. Easter moves. And because Easter moves, Ash Wednesday before it moves. And because that moves, the Ascension moves and Pentecost moves. And just to throw in one more, there's the Feast of Corpus Christi as well. And so, so why is that sung right now? Well, we just finished, we're finishing today the, the Christmas season and we're launching ourselves into this new year. Now, there is a practical side that 
that annunciation done from uh, sung at, at this time would be the way of basically the equivalent of a parish bulletin. Before there were bulletins and before there were bulletin boards, someone had to say it and like spread the word. And so it was sung out and I saw you were all dil diligently writing down what those dates were uh, to, in order to be able to get them in your calendars or rather you'll just let Microsoft or Google tell you when it, when it comes along. But, but it's more than just an announcement about those things because it is giving, it's almost like, it's almost like a movie trailer about what's to come. We just, we're finishing Christmas, this birth of our, our King, our Lord, but so now what? Well, that's what that announcement's about. We pass through this period of preparation in the, in the of ordinary time, and then we get into Lent and through sacrifice leading up to the culmination of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, this glorious resurrection. And, and so it's like we're, we're giving us a preview of the movie that we're going to be living in liturgically throughout the upcoming months. So that's what was just sung. And that only happens today. It's the only time that happens. Okay, so, but we're celebrating Epiphany. So that was a sidebar. Now we're into the, the, the homily here. We're celebrating Epiphany today. We have our perfect, our manger scene here, our creche, and we have the three magi, the three kings, uh, kneeling down in adoration before the Lord. Uh, now, now, who were they? Well, we don't know exactly because scripture is pretty, uh, uh, pretty brief on that, but they're the, the words king has come from some of the prophecies about their arrival. The word kings is applied to them. It's also here in the actual gospel passage, the word magi is, is applied to it. Magos in the, in the Greek would be actually like literally like magician or like wizard. And so we have this king, wizard, priest, like high priest of another religion. Uh, as best the, the, the church fathers would speak about, they're coming from Persia. So like probably like Zoroastrian high priests of, of, some, of some type, king, priest kind of figure. So how did they get there? How did they find out about this? They show up in Jerusalem unannounced saying, hey, we're, we're here. It's, uh, the, we saw the, the, king, the new king's star rising, so we came and just freaked everybody out. Because the Israelites knew that this king, this prophecy of a Messiah was to happen at some point, but like no one was expecting it then. But, but so how did they get that? They're in Zoroastrianism and some of the other Eastern religions, it's not like there's some big messianic prophecy that everybody knew about, and, and that's why all of Persia showed up in No, is three. Three guys. Actually, we don't even know it was three. In the gospel, it doesn't say three. It just says wise men or magi. Tradition kind of turns it into three because there's three gifts. So it's okay, well, each one's got to carry something. That's, that's how we end up with three. But we don't know it's actually three. But, but that's where that, that comes from. But So what was going on with them? How did they get an invitation? Because clearly God was bringing them there. The star some kind of a prophecy that they knew, hey, we got to start moving now. Load up the camels, bring your gold, your incense. And they left, and it seems like they were the only ones doing it. My own personal theory is that there must be some level of profound authenticness about their desire and search for truth. Sincerity, they're seekers in the, the best way possible. They're honest with themselves, genuine. And so I think that that's how God got the message through to them. And they read in the stars, not just this one star, but somehow knew that that star is this new king, this new ruler of, of the world who's coming, and they got up and they moved. It's obviously a gift of the Holy Spirit. How else could they get there? How else? Jesus gets to kind of decide, not kind of, who's going to be at his birth. He has an invitation list. 
and these three were on it, of everyone else in the world. And when they arrive, we have this beautiful, iconic image that we recreate with the nativity scene. And, and it's, we, we know from in Bethlehem that the, the stable was actually a cave that was used as a, a, as a stable. It's, it's there. You can go visit it today. And Mary would have been right next to the manger. The animals would have been there. Mary would have been radiant, just exuding peace and joy and holiness and this reflection of God's beauty just coming out of her. And Christ himself would have been doing that and even more so. Joseph, the shepherds, the animals, as I mentioned. How did the shepherds get there? Invitation, personal, direct. Why them? They didn't deserve it. They didn't earn it. They didn't pay VIP access. God just gave it to them. And then come in these three high priests, and, and as the, the passage just made so, so well, it, it articulates it here, they, they go in there overjoyed seeing the star. They see the child and their mother and his mother. They prostrated himself and did him homage, is the line here. We, we have them here, in, them in these, these very uh, royal garbs uh, uh, of some sort. And you, you can imagine, it, it wasn't like they had set up, it wasn't a throne room in there. They're, when they prostrate themselves, you know what else is on the ground. But it's like they didn't care. That wasn't the point. Didn't matter. Oh, sorry, we, we were going to prostrate, but actually, can we tidy up a little bit first? Laid themselves out on the ground and brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and, herb, and, and myrrh. We know what the, the symbol of the gold for a king, the frankincense for, for God, and the myrrh for someone who is to be buried. Someone who is to be sacrificed. And then they're warned in this dream not to go back to Herod because Herod was, although he said he wanted to come and adore the king, that's not quite what he was wanting to do. And so they left by another way. But this icon, Mary, the Magi, the shepherds, the, the, the animals got to be there. Why did they get to be there? I think there's a genuineness and a simplicity in the animal kingdom. So yes, you dog lovers, I bet there was a dog there. No cats, just dogs. And what's the meaning of that, though? Like, as we contemplate that, and that's what, that's what the manger scene's for, to contemplate, a scene to contemplate. Go up to the Met. There's a bunch of paintings of the, the visitation of the Magi up there. Spend some time there. Masterpieces. You're in New York. You've got to do stuff like that. You, it's a privilege. But, but even just, just right, right here, it's like, first of all, the highest becomes the lowest. The divinity God from on, in, in heaven comes down, and he doesn't just come down to some earthly palace here. He goes all the way down to the very lowest place you can find. And if there was another lower place, it's like that's where he would have gone. The highest becoming the lowest. The kings, these, these wise men coming and laying down their gifts and laying their bodies down before the Lord in adoration. The high becoming low. Voluntarily, willingly, joyfully rejoicing at the opportunity that they get to, that they get to do this. Everyone that could have been invited this great equalizing, like the six trains, everybody's there. The, you know, the, the king cake, I don't know, maybe if you have some New Orleans, uh, uh, some Louisianans, or, or, the, or in Spanish it's called the Rosca de Reyes. It's this, this circular uh, ring cake that's, that's interwoven. There's like two bands that, and there's different colors and so forth. And you hide a little, little plastic baby Jesus choking hazard in there. And, and um, 
and so, but that's a, a, class, is a typical thing for uh, the celebration of the kings. Well, during the French Revolution, they said, okay, we're changing the name of that thing because that's too Christian. We're going to call it the equality cake. Well, guess what? That is awfully darn Christian because that's what was happening in that feast day. It got changed back. But there would be no better place to be on the face of the earth that day than in that cave, in the mustiness of it, the smelliness of it, with this most eclectic group, foreigners, the, the shepherds. I mean, I don't know how we would recreate, recreate it today. We'd have, we'd have to bring people from all around. Non, they weren't Jews that came in there. The shepherds were barely practicing. And that's who Jesus wanted there. The great equalizing event. The high becomes low. So who missed out? Who didn't show up or didn't get an invitation or maybe they did but they chose to ignore it? Well, Herod, first and foremost, they come, the wise men come to Jerusalem and think, well, it's the capital of this, this place where this king's going to be. He doesn't know about where, I mean, he's a, maybe he knew some vaguely. He has to ask, hey, well, where's the, this child supposed to be born? But it's already what's getting in the way and preventing him from being at the best place to be in the entire world at that moment. What's preventing him is his own pride. And this one, I want to hang on to the power because if, there's, if another king's coming along and I'm the king now, it's fear. Who is coveting his, his, his position, not knowing that had he accepted the Lord, he would have been the happiest man ever. So who else didn't make it there? Well, the, the Jewish high priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, all in Jerusalem. Same thing. Well, we can cut them a little bit of slack. Imagine, like here now, today, today, if three um, three Hindu uh, wise men come in here right now during the Mass and were to say, we're, we're here, it's the second coming, we, just, we know about it from our prophecies and there's a star that was going to come and, and so we're here to see it, so where's it going to happen? We would, like, I don't know, probably write them off pretty quick. But that's what was happening. These total outsiders are coming in. But still, they knew where the child was going to be born. Pride, arrogance. No, not, not these people. They're, they're, they're not, they haven't studied the scriptures. They don't know about these things. They have to ask us to get some of the information. Of course they're not. They don't know what's going on. So I think there is the lesson for us. Who gets invited? But those who are humble enough to have their eyes open to see the star, to read the tea leaves, so to speak. Our Lord is coming not just for the practicing Catholics. He's coming for absolutely everyone. And not just at the final coming, now too. There was a, a last Christmas a year ago, there was a, a gentleman, uh, we celebrate Midnight Mass, and I was in the foyer, and, and there was, a, there was a, a, a gentleman waiting for till everyone went so because he, he wanted to talk to me and said, uh, in, in broken, I think I might have told this story before, in, in broken um, English, I think he's from, I'm, I'm not sure where he's from, it could, it could have been, um, oh, I, think, I think Chinese, but he said, Father, I, how do I become Catholic? And he said, well, and I just kind of went into RCIA mode, and he's probably asking about the classes, which he probably knows about and wants to get signed up. And, and, it's a, and all of a sudden, I kind of stopped myself, well, wait a minute, wait, let's, so, so why, why, why are you here? He said, well, my friend is Catholic, my roommate, his roommate was not there, and he told me there's this thing called Midnight Mass in his religion, so I looked it up on the internet, and I came. He just came by himself, midnight. And I want to be Catholic. 
How does he get that invitation in there? There's a depth of sincerity, seeking, honesty. There's, he's just, where, where there is goodness, where there is truth, where there is beauty, I'm going. So this lesson, I think for us though too, is, is to ask for this gift of the Lord, to be a true seeker, always. Always. To have this kind of sincerity with ourselves, never to lie to ourselves about what our intentions are, what we're, or what's, what's really motivating. Just like, why, why lie to yourself? Honesty. Sincerity. I mean, all that together is humility. And, and humility is to be truth seeking. Not about groveling, it's about truth seeking. And to be able to prostrate ourselves, even if it's in the mud of a stable, when we find it. If we allow ourselves to do that, we'll see through any of the, see straight through any of the false prophets that are out there because our heart just takes us straight in. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see the star. We'll see the message. And God will be able to lead us right to where he's invited us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.